Hi guys. Uh, in the last video, I went through cloning and biotechnology. Uh, some of the stuff may have gone off the screen, so this is your chance to uh, see if you can catch all of that. I'll get out of the way. The, the point of these videos is just to kind of go through uh, all the content, give it some kind of structure so that you know, A, that uh, your revision is thorough and it's not missing anything, and B, you understand the relationship between all the different things that are going on in a topic. And if you can do those two things, then given an exam question, I think you'll be in a better position to make decisions about, right, what is the content that this question is about? What's the best way to answer this question? What do I use? And I think your memory will, it'll, th it will be an aid to your memory as well because um, you know all the information kind of fits together it's not separately uh, it's not separate independent bits of information that you have to uh, kind of stack up all right so um, let's get into it what I've done is I've just made a little comment that responses responses increase the chance Responses increase the chance of survival. So whether we're talking about reflex responses, whether we're talking about phototropism, all of those things, what they do is they increase the chance of that organism being able to survive its situation, its surrounding, uh, changing environments, etc. Okay, so that's a unifying concept. All right, so let's begin then with plants now uh, the plant responses um, plants the plant responses happen through plant hormones okay so understand how or do your best to try and understand how plant hormones work okay um, there's the the hormone that's released in one part of the plant as a result of some some kind of stimulus and that hormone travels through the plant via its various transport routes or from cell to cell. Um, and then eventually it binds to a receptor on the target cell and, and binding to the receptor causes intracellular signaling and the response. All right, so we have plant hormones. Now, what are the uh, kind of responses that could be made? Well, we're talking about responses to Herbivory, another main kind of response that we need to know about is tropisms. Another one, uh, I had them separately, but I should have put them together, but anyway, uh, we had responses to abiotic stresses, all right, changes like uh, lack of water, uh, temperature getting too hot, uh, things like that. And finally, we had seed germination. So basically like a growth kind of response, seed germination and stem elongation. Okay, all right. So what I've got going on next is we start with herbivory and what are the main responses that, you, that plants uh, make to herbivory? Herbivory means um, you know, getting eaten by uh, another, or, or getting eaten by an animal, or like insect pests, things like that. So, um, main responses, you've got folding in response to touch. I, I think I'm going too slowly here, so we need to speed it up. Because I, wa I want this to be a very quick summary of all the content. Folding in response to touch, and I'm just gonna put another arrow here. I'm not gonna go over the mechanism, but it might help to be aware of the mechanism. There's, there's some good biology going on there with ion movements across membranes and osmosis and cells changing shape. Okay, so I'm just gonna put down here, process. Seems a bit of a cop out, but this is not, you know, we need to understand what we're trying to do here. All right, and then the other response to herbivory is chemical defenses. So that overlaps a little bit with communicable diseases in module four, which is also on the content list this year. Um, so we've got chemical defenses. I'm just gonna 
write down the names of the main ones. You do need to know the names of these and have like a one sentence explanation about how they prevent or are a response or a defense against herbivory. Okay, so we have tannins, we have alkaloids, terpenoids, and pheromones. Okay, they, they, they are similar, but they have slight differences in how they work and what they do. So make sure, again, not in any great detail, but understand what they do to uh, prevent herbivory or defend against herbivory. Let's keep moving on then. Um, what we've got next is, actually let's just get into the main business of it. Let's go to tropisms. We need to understand that tropisms are mainly carried out via the hormone auxin. So this is our first named hormone. Um, there are like a few key ones. Up till now it's just been general responses, but now we're getting into the hormones. So we've got auxin responsible for tropisms. What are the kind of uh, tropisms that auxin can be involved in? We've got responses to the direction of light. So allowing the plant to grow in the direction of light to maximize its uh, kind of uh, exposure to a higher light intensity and greater photosynthesis for its survival. And we have also got geotropism or gravitotropism. In terms of phototropism and geotropism, I, there, I believe there are some uh, evidences. So what are the, what's the evidence, what is the evidence that auxin is involved in phototropism? So these are set practicals, not that you might have done them, but these are the experimental evidences and their results that show that auxin is involved in phototropism. Evidence of auxin's involvement in phototropism. Next, we go on to, or I would then go to how auxin works. So that's all the stuff on auxin's, uh, auxin's involvement in causing a proton uh, transport into the cell wall area, activating the enzymes, the expansins, uh, breaking the crosslinks between cellulose and the cell wall, allowing the cell wall to become uh, flexible so that when water enters the cell, the cells elongate. So how auxin works or how auxin causes cell elongation, wherever it may be, okay? Um, so from the evidence, we understand how auxin causes the phototropism because it accumulates on the dark side of the shoot uh, and, and causes the cells on that side to elongate, okay? So in fact, if I just sketch out here, the fact that auxin is accumulating here, the light is coming from that direction, you've seen those diagrams, and that's the evidence that we're talking about. Okay. Let's keep going. Evidence to do with uh, auxin, how auxin works is its own separate thing. Next, uh, we have then, we have mechanism, okay. And we also have, well, actually, should I just, yeah. All right, let's keep moving then. We've also got uh, geotropism then. And I think we, with geotropism, we need to, we need to understand there's a little, there's, a, there's this nice graph in the textbook about how the different auxin concentrations affect plant uh, roots and shoots and buds differently in terms of kind of being stimulatory or inhibitory in terms of growth. And because of that, uh, auxin has almost different effects in the root as opposed to the shoot. Okay, so geotropisms are explained that way. Uh, yeah, I think I'm happy with that. And then we next, well, and, and there are some kind of practical investigations. So how would you, how would you investigate um, the role of auxin in geotropisms? And you would use a device called a Kleinostat. So just make sure that you know what that is. 
and how it works and how you, do, how, how you might use that very briefly in an experiment. And this is where I forgot to talk about apical dominance. Okay, right. Next, we will go to the next uh, kind of response that plants can make abiotic stress. So what are abio what potentially could be abiotic stresses and what could be the response to them? So abiotic stresses could be if it gets too hot and the plant is losing too much water or if there's a, a low availability of water, you might want to reduce the loss of water through the leaf leaves and so you might want to close the stomata. So one of the things, one of the responses that plants can make is stomatal closure, right, in response to an abiotic stress. And stomatal closure is uh, or, uh, effected through the action of the hormone abscisic acid, A, B, A, okay? So that's our next named hormone. Again, there is a process, okay? And depending on how much time you have available, just like have a look at that. But for many purposes, it might just be enough that you understand that AVA is involved. If you have the luxury of time, you might wanna just look at how ABA does that. It's not a very long process. You can describe it in about four to five points. Let's keep moving. Um, abiotic stresses, we've got stomatal closure. <clears throat> Another abiotic stress, however, is cold and winter. Um, and in those times, in those times, we need some deciduous or deci deciduous plants and trees lose their leaves. Uh, as a kind of response to the reduced daylight hours and the colder temperatures. The promoter of leaf fall abscission is ethene. Okay, but it does do this in kind of like a, a antagonistic way. So uh, depending on the balance, uh, auxin is involved as well. So as long as things are good, and there's no abiotic stress, enough light, uh, temperate climate, I suppose, auxins will, be, auxins will be higher. And in that situation, ethene, the action of ethene is inhibited and leaves stay on the branches. However, when the auxin levels go down because of less uh, or reduced light levels or colder temperatures, less growth, uh, when the auxin levels go down, ethene levels rise, and then ethene promotes leaf fall abscission. Again, there is a process, and you do need to know it. But again, you know, whether you do well on an exam sometimes, or in many cases, I think, doesn't come down to the level of detail that you know every single bit, but it often comes down to your appreciation of the bigger picture and making good decisions about what content you're going to use to answer the question, not necessarily the level of detail with which you can answer the question. Okay, anyway, uh, we are there and we are then going to also move on to seed germination and stem elongation. So seed germination and stem elongation are both carried out by the hormone gibberellin, or not carried out, but you know, the primary uh, actor in that process is are the horm or are the gibberellin family of hormones, okay? Um, I do reserve the right to spell things incorrectly. Uh, it's my YouTube video. Seed germination, uh, right then. So gibberellins, in terms of seed germination, yes, know the process. Gibberellins promote seed germination. Interestingly, abscisic acid is acting antagonistically to that process, which ties up with its role as a kind of dormancy promoting hormone, right? Gibberellin is in opposition to that. It's a growth uh, hormone. Okay, so seed germination, we need to know the process. 
but also we need to know what the evi what's the experimental evidence that gibberellins are involved in this seed germination process. We need to have a couple of points ready to say on that. Okay, uh, next we have, don't, I don't want to use too much space here, but we have gibberellins also involved in stem elongation again. Well, here, I don't believe we need to know the process of that or how it does that, but um, we, do need to un we do need to know that it does that and we need to know what the evidence is what the evidence is that gibberellins are involved in that process. What I'm basing a lot of these decisions on is A, going through the specification, B, uh, having referred to uh, some textbooks, all right, and C, experience of looking at exam questions and kind of the things that generally tend to get asked and the things that are, are avoided or have been avoided up to now. Not avoided, but like, they haven't really been asked before while, while other things have been asked on a repeated basis. So based on that, I'm kind of giving this information. Okay, um, yeah, and I think that that is mostly it in terms of plant responses. Only one last thing, which is that plant hormones have applications. Um, where shall I put this? Plant hormones can have applications. All right. For example, uh, ethene is used in fruit ripening. Going into the plant animal responses area there. Um, and auxins are used as weed killers as well as they are used as rooting compounds okay so that yeah with no explanations of anything pretty much but that is the main kind of the way I look. I mean, there's, there's various different ways you could uh, organize this information. This is just my version of it. You, you could have done it like, um, you could have looked at each hormone and what it does, but I've tried to um, group it by the type of response. Okay. Yeah, but there's, there's other ways to do it also. All right, now we will look at animal responses.